Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. North Korea fires a missile over Japan. What's the impact of this latest provocation? Bombs, cameras, action. Russia puts on a show for the world. Chris Brown explains what's behind the boasting. Plus, the return of At Issue, Andrew, Chantal, and Althea on the volatile issues that could flare up next week. Pushing the world to the edge of its patience tonight. We begin with another provocative missile launch by North Korea, in spite of, or likely in response to, further sanctions from the international community imposed just days ago. South Korea says the regime fired the ballistic missile from the capital, Pyongyang. It flew over the Japanese island of Hokkaido at an estimated altitude of 770 kilometers before crashing down in the Pacific, traveling a total of some 3,700 kilometers. Japan has expressed outrage and is in close contact with South Korea and the United States. For more on this latest launch and what it could mean, let's bring in Paul Hunter. So, Paul, what can you tell us so far? If nothing else, Wendy, this signals sanctions against North Korea and warnings from around the world have been utterly ineffective. Indeed, Japan tonight said it absolutely cannot accept the repeated, outrageous, provocative actions by North Korea. This appears to have been a single intermediate range ballistic missile and significantly it's reported to have flown farther than any other test missile yet fired by North Korea. It did not threaten the U.S. territory of Guam nor for that matter North America but of course that's the fear over where North Korea is headed. North Korea's latest comments on the U.S. are that it should be quote beaten to death like a rabid dog. South Korea meanwhile in response tonight fired its own missile tests into the sea, and both that country and Japan have called emergency security council meetings. All of this, at the same time, it's clear North Korea is making progress on developing nuclear weapons, this month successfully testing its sixth such missile or, uh, nuclear bomb and strongest ever. Tensions tonight, Wendy, are ratcheting ever higher. Any response from the U.S. yet? Yeah, we know Donald Trump has been briefed on this tonight. Uh, who can forget his words last month when he said North Korea would be, quote, met with fire and fury like the world has never seen if such stuff continued. Trump's lately been pressing China to step up on this matter and press its ally, North Korea, to back down. Just today, Trump talked about his relationship with the Chinese leadership on this and said, quote, the people of this country, the U.S., will be very, very safe. Meanwhile, the U.N. Security Council will meet tomorrow in New York to consider what steps to take in light of this latest missile test. Wendy. Big story. Thanks so much, Paul. Paul Hunter in Washington tonight. Three years after declaring its caliphate, it looks like the beginning of the end for ISIS in Syria. By all accounts, the brutal militant group is losing ground, while the Assad regime regains its strength, thanks in large part to its powerful ally and protector, Russia. Since joining the conflict two years ago, the Russians have unleashed a staggering amount of firepower, pounding ISIS forces which are barely holding on to their self-declared capital, Raqqa, and largely reduced to a shrinking pocket in eastern Syria. It has been a potent display of Russian military strength, one they now want the whole world to see, to the point of setting up a carefully orchestrated show for reporters today. Our Chris Brown was one of those given a front row seat. With one of Russia's most modern warships serving as a viewing platform far out in the Mediterranean Sea, Russia's military set out to put on a show of force for the world to see. Its intervention in Syria's civil war has been decisive, thanks in part to firepower such as this. The Russian organizers of this trip promised the foreign media something dramatic, something they'd never seen before, and this was it. Several cruise missiles fired from a submarine headed in the direction of Syria. Turns out there were actually two Russian submarines and they fired seven missiles. One of the subs surfaced a short time later. 
General Igor Konashenkov says the missiles flew over 600 kilometers to targets in ISIS-held parts of East Syria near Deir Azor, one of ISIS's last remaining holdouts in the country. This video released by Russia's military reportedly shows a command post being destroyed. As for human casualties, the general said they don't count terrorists as humans. Some rights groups, though, have said Russian bombs often miss their mark, killing civilians. Since Russia directly entered the Syrian conflict in 2015 on the side of the government of Bashar al-Assad, its dominance in the air has shrunk ISIS territory to just 15% of the country. All week, Russia's military has hurried reporters to venues around Syria, including a demining school near Homs for new Syrian recruits. Clearing all the mines here is likely a 10-year job, and Russia is trying to demonstrate it's committed. The trip also included stops at badly damaged UNESCO heritage sites, such as the Grand Mosque in Aleppo. The leader here confirmed Chechnya's strongman Ramzan Kadyrov, an ally of Russian President Vladimir Putin, has pledged millions of dollars to help rebuild it. Russia's government clearly sees advantage at home and abroad for trumpeting its role in ending the fighting in Syria and for what will come after. Chris Brown, CBC News, off the coast of Syria. And Russian forces were also busy closer to home today with large-scale war games kicking off in Belarus. Officially, about 13,000 troops are taking part, though neighboring countries suspect that number is much higher, including Ukraine, which remains deeply distrustful of Russia, even though Kiev is now open to the idea of international peacekeepers to mitigate the conflict with pro-Russia separatists in the country's east, a proposal also welcomed by Vladimir Putin. Ukraine has one strict caveat, however, that no Russian troops be among them. Three months after London's horrific Grenfell Tower fire, the reckoning begins. The inquiry into that disaster officially got underway today. Its purpose to determine how such a deadly event could have happened in the first place and how to prevent another one. As Thomas Daigle reports, convincing survivors to buy into the process may be tough. The heart of this community is still healing, filled with love for those lost and anger for the mistakes that led to the disaster. When you've seen the whole thing, people that you knew, people jumping out uh, of the building, the fire, and it's been, it was the most difficult hours in my life. Still painful now, the sight of that burnt out high rise visible from all around, where at least 80 people were killed in the middle of the night. The fire quickly spread from a fourth floor refrigerator all the way to the top. We were evacuated and we've been in a hotel ever since. And a lot of us feel like if we can get through this, we can get through anything. Justice for Grenfell. It's been a long three months culminating in this, the first day of a public inquiry. Do sit down, please. The chairman, a retired judge, acknowledged from the outset his work can't undo pain. But it can and will provide answers to the pressing questions of how a disaster of this kind could occur in 21st century London. After that statement, a lawyer for the families stood up to ask a question. The chairman just kept walking, angering those who already feel their opinions don't matter here. He just walked out. It was very disgusting and disappointing. At the core of the Grenfell inquiry, how combustible cladding was added to the outside with no sprinklers or second staircase inside. For neighbor Marcia Haynes, her T-shirt says it all. Then it's murder. It's corporate murder. And we want to know why people don't been arrested. The inquiry chairman has pledged to give the prime minister an initial report by next spring. Already the questions and the pressure are piling up. Tonight, a crowd marched in silence, remembering their neighbors who were killed. Then, a sign, this community plans to be heard. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. So what is the housing situation for the surviving Grenfell Tower residents today? Most are still in limbo three months later. Almost 200 families and individuals were left homeless by the disaster. So far, only three households are in new permanent homes. The rest are still in temporary apartments or hotels. 
but the situation may be finally improving. The Grenville Fire Response Team says it has now acquired over 100 move-in ready homes and is looking to buy more. Coming up. So this is the river that burst its banks. Flood zones are a bigger issue than ever, but we show you why politicians tend to ignore them, except in Ontario. Plus, tattoo ink leaves tiny metal particles in a vital organ. Donald Trump managed to throw his strongest supporters into fits of fury today, with their fury aimed squarely at Trump himself. Among his transgressions, suggesting that perhaps his long-promised wall would have to wait. He said it in the wake of a meeting with top Democrats, another thorn in the side of some Republicans, especially since it ended with the word deal being tossed around. Here again is Paul Hunter trying to make sense of it all. When it comes to that wall on the U.S.-Mexican border, and more to the point, the parts of that border that don't have a wall, forgive Americans who now wonder what's up with that campaign pledge by then-candidate yes. Donald Trump. We will build a wall. Today, President Trump stood by the essence of that, but seemed to hedge on when. The wall will come later. And Trump had earlier today tweeted a kind of alternate description for building at least some of it as new renovation of old and existing fences and walls. All of it. In the hours after a big meeting last night with two top Democrats, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, after which Democrats strongly suggested a deal was near on another issue, protection from deportation for hundreds of thousands of young illegal immigrants, something Democrats espouse while many Republicans oppose. In today, recounting last night's talks with Trump, said Pelosi, strengthening the border could be a part of that deal, but... We would review border security measures uh, that do not include building a wall uh, as, as we go forward. Trump backers were gobsmacked. On the otherwise pro-Trump website Breitbart, once again now run by Trump's former chief strategist, ugly headlines and even uglier reader comments on Trump's apparent moves on the immigrant issue and on the wall. As right-wing radio host Laura Ingram put it, At these rallies during the 2015-2016, I don't remember hearing, repair the fence, repair the fence. He's going to get creamed on this. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, Trump's fellow Republicans tried to reframe those talks with Democrats. The president and the chief of staff called me from Air Force One uh, today to uh, discuss what was discussed. And it was a discussion, not an agreement or a negotiation. While Trump himself weighed in from Florida, hinting if Democrats don't sign off on a wall, there's no deal on the illegal immigrants. We have to have a wall. If the wall is going to be obstructed when we need the funds at a little bit later date, we'll be determining how much we need. Uh, then we're not doing anything. Right? So, deal or no deal? Is Trump caving or negotiating? For the moment, he seems to have left all sides either optimistic, fearful, or baffled. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. The deaths of eight seniors at a Florida nursing home have prompted a criminal investigation. This is very tragic. It's very sad. Nearly 150 people were left without air conditioning when the facility lost power during Hurricane Irma. Three people were found dead inside the sweltering building yesterday. Five others died later in hospital. Global Affairs Canada has confirmed there is at least one Canadian missing in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma. It says it is currently helping the family of the person who is believed to have been in St. Martin and that consular officials are in contact with local authorities. A six-year-old Saskatchewan boy was killed in an apparent dog attack yesterday. RCMP were called to a home in Ryston, about 50 kilometers south of Regina. They say Cameron Moshansky was dead when they arrived. Two dogs, believed to be Alaskan Malamutes, were seized. The boy's aunt says the attack happened at his grandparents' house. Police say it is too early to speculate about what happened or whether any charges will be laid. A new snapshot of the country's opioid crisis shows the rate of hospitalizations and deaths is increasing. 
About 16 Canadians were hospitalized every day for opioid overdose in the past year. That's up from 13 a day two years ago. That doesn't include people who go to an ER and are not admitted or those who die. More than 2,800 people died from suspected opioid-related overdose, about eight a day. We know that three out of four Canadians who died in 2016 are men. We also know that the number of deaths involving fentanyl more than doubled between the beginning of 2016 and the beginning of 2017. The majority of opioid-related deaths also involved another substance that was not an op opioid. There are renewed calls tonight for Conservative Senator Lynn Bayak to resign. Bayak managed to create another storm around herself by again making controversial comments about Indigenous people. But in this instance, she didn't only insult, she also got basic Canadian history wrong. Katie Simpson has the story. Senator Lynn Bayak is yet again the source of self-inflicted trouble for the Conservatives. Her latest unprompted comments about Indigenous peoples are triggering a fresh wave of criticism today. She seems to be really stuck in a solid state, intransigent state of denial about Canadian history and what happened to Indigenous peoples. Bayak is facing renewed calls to resign or to be kicked out of the Conservative caucus after using her Senate website to say this to Indigenous people. Trade your status card for a Canadian citizenship with a fair and negotiated payout to settle all the outstanding land claims and treaties. None of us are leaving, so let's stop the guilt and blame and find a way to live together. Bayak appeared not to realize that Indigenous people born in Canada are in fact Canadian citizens. To have a member of the Canadian Senate uh, be uh, so incredibly ignorant about who Canadian citizens uh, are, mm -hmm. is, uh, it's, it's, it, it is deeply offensive. Winnipeg's mayor also called Bayak out on Twitter using the hashtag Make It Awkward. It's part of a larger social media campaign backed by other big city mayors to hold people behind discriminatory comments accountable, even if it's uncomfortable. To say that that isn't a legacy that our country needs to deal with, to undermine that in any way is, is pretty awkward. Bayak has made controversial comments before, using a Senate speech to downplay the negative impact of residential schools and rejecting demands she learn more about Indigenous peoples. I don't need any more education. I've been involved since we double dated when I was 15 with an Aboriginal fellow and his wife. Bayak was punished by her party for those comments, removed from the Senate's Aboriginal Peoples Committee. But she did end up spending part of her summer meeting with Indigenous peoples near her home. The Conservatives are standing by Bayak, even though Andrew Scheer is trying to distance himself from her comments. A statement from his office tonight says that Bayak's views do not represent the party's position. But that statement makes no mention of any possible sanctions or possible removal from caucus. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Ontario Liberal MP Arnold Chan has died. <laughs> Chan was elected three years ago in a by-election. He became an advocate for democracy and encouraged his colleagues to work together for Canadians rather than against each other, a point he made during an emotional speech just before the House rose for the summer back in June. When we listen, we listen to one another, despite our strong differences. That's when democracy really happens. That's the challenge that's going on around the world right now. No one's listening. Everyone's just talking at one another. We have to listen to each other. Okay, wait, can you leave your lights on? Chan was diagnosed with cancer two years ago. He was 50 years old and is survived by his wife and three sons. Straight ahead, a professor at a top university and the discovery of his fake degree. Margaret Atwood's farm is located in southwestern Ontario. She doesn't want people to know exactly where because she doesn't like visitors, especially not the uninvited variety. Carloads of drunken fans have descended upon the farm in the past, and the memories of them on her doorstep is not something she cherishes. Margaret Atwood has always had an image problem. Many people have thought her tough, humorless, 
too strident in her feminist beliefs, too much the ideologue in her politics. But that image is changing, as Margaret Atwood herself changes. Three years ago, she had a baby girl, Eleanor Jess, and starting then, Margaret Atwood says, the public image of her as Dragon Lady began to change. Something really a horrible cliché took place. I wouldn't have believed it. As soon as I had a baby, everybody started writing about me in much modified terms as a sort of motherly person. <laughs> so believe it or not, there you are. Um, I don't think I had really, quotes, changed all that much. In other words, I don't think I was as, I was as tough as everybody thought before I had the baby, and I don't think I was as, as soft and, and sort of bouncy as everybody <laughs> thought afterwards. When you write, do you set yourself a schedule? Do you follow a set schedule? Um, before I had a child, I used to write all day, maybe 10 hours. I would get up at about 10 and stay up till 3 in the morning and uh, worry until about 6 p.m. and then start writing. But now I have to limit the amount of time I spend on anxiety <laughs> because otherwise I would use that five hours on that and I only have five hours a day. I work from about one o'clock until about six. Yeah. Do you have a gut feeling about how it is going to be received, whether it's Lady Oracle or Life Before Man? Uh, yes, I do, and sometimes I'm wrong. We've seen devastating scenes in recent weeks of catastrophic flooding. And in the aftermath of extreme weather events, one big question often emerges. Why do cities continue to allow people to live and build in high-risk areas? As Christine Barak reports, experts say outdated maps and politics play a major role. American scientists say it's not right. Too many homes outside clearly mapped flood risk zones are now underwater. There's a lot of people who are going to be hurting. While less extreme, floodwaters are also seeping into more Canadian homes. If you think it's just bad luck, experts say think again. Effectively, the models that would delineate where the water is going to go when the big storms hit today, uh, uh, they're about 20, 25 years out of date. City planners, public safety officials and property owners use those outdated flood maps. We're now seeing extreme weather patterns and climate combined with urban sprawl, producing more rainfall with fewer places for it to go. But funding for a federal flood reduction program dried up in 1995, leaving provinces and municipalities to map their own flood zones. From a political perspective, it's always also tricky because um, not that many people are really interested in knowing. Homes built near water tend to be worth more and owners pay higher property taxes. Flood risk warnings could devalue those properties and deter new developments. But Ontario sees it differently. So this is the river that burst its banks. This is the river that burst its banks. In fact, most of the rivers in our jurisdiction burst its banks. In 1954, 81 people in Toronto died when the remnants of Hurricane Hazel hit. Several homes along the Humber River were washed away. Laws changed. No one was allowed to rebuild there. Conservation authorities still make the latest flood projections publicly available. It's important to have this updated mapping so we understand where the risks lie. Bev Silva wishes she had checked and been prepared. Three floods left her emotionally and financially devastated. Do your research. Find out. Talk to a lot of people. Talk to the neighbours and see if you know, what they've been through. Severe flooding in the Calgary area in 2013 prompted the federal government to re-engage in flood zone mapping. Experts hope that'll offer new information soon because many Canadians have no idea how vulnerable their homes are until they're knee deep. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. Now to something that isn't affected by water, tattoos. If you thought the permanent ink only runs skin deep, a new study suggests that isn't the case. Researchers have found pigment particles in human lymph nodes. As Vicodopia reports, the health risks remain unknown. Ariano Delena runs a tight ship. His studio is inspected by health officials, and he pays close attention to the ever-changing variety and quality of inks on the market, always on the lookout for pigments that don't fade or cause skin reactions in his customers. Some tattooers, they start developing and it's safer in that it heals faster. 
But healing doesn't tell the whole story about tattoo pigments. Scientists have long suspected they affect lymph nodes, the glands critical to the immune system. So researchers used new ultramicroscopic x-ray technology to analyze lymph node tissue from four deceased donors with tattoos. The team found nanoparticles, nickel, chromium, manganese and cobalt, all found in the tattoos themselves. We actually have a proof that also the contaminations are still in the body after healing of the tattoos and not just in the tattooings. The nanoparticles are about one millionth of a millimeter or smaller. First of all, we're going to get your consent. This Edmonton dermatologist says it's not clear if those nanoparticles are dangerous. I think it's a little early to make any absolute conclusions, um, so I wouldn't raise alarm bells quite yet. Part of the problem with trying to examine the effects of tattoo pigments is that they continue to evolve and much of the chemistry is unknown. There is such a broad art to tattooing that people will seek out new and different techniques. So I think over time that will make it a bit more complex to know what the implications are. So I think a lot more study and attention is warranted. It's estimated 20% of adults in Canada have tattoos, even more for younger adults. Despite their growing popularity, Health Canada neither approves nor checks the safety of pigments. That's up to the tattoo industry. Vic Adopia, CBC News, Toronto. An investigation by our colleagues at CBC's Marketplace has discovered that more than 800 Canadians bought their degrees overseas from a popular diploma mill in Pakistan, including a professor in Toronto who's taught at one of the nation's most prestigious universities and continues to teach at a Toronto college. Asha Tomlinson has our story. Hi. Dubravko Groblich has taught at some of the top post-secondary schools in the country. On his LinkedIn profile, the University of Toronto, Ryerson University, and most recently, Seneca College. He's got a bachelor's from Croatia, and he's also posted his master's degree in computer science from Almeida University. But that school and degree are fake. I did my postgrad online. When Marketplace producers, posing as students, asked about the university he attended. Oh, you did your postgrad online? Yeah. Where did you do it? In... Uh... <laughs> Forgetting that those two things are always messing up my head. Uh, downstairs. Grablich is one of more than 800 Canadians on a database obtained by Marketplace. Business records from the world's largest degree mill, Exact, based in Pakistan. We are seeing a worldwide epidemic of degree mills. We're talking probably grossing a billion dollars a year. About 100 schools and accreditation bodies, including Almeida, are affiliated with this company. Grablich said he was able to complete his master's based on his past education. So it basically was uh, just verifying my knowledge. Uh, so the exams were actually for discussion. It's basically uh, 11 uh, foreign, uh, foreign exams. When questioned about his Almeida credentials, he wouldn't do an on-camera interview. You don't want to speak to us on camera at all to talk about your master's and why you attended this school that is linked to a diploma mill scheme. That is exactly correct. You can talk to Seneca College and that is final. We contacted Seneca. It wouldn't comment on Professor Grablich or his phony degree. But in a statement, it says, we take many factors into consideration, including unique industry experience when hiring. And while Dubravko Groblich still appears to work at Seneca College, he's now removed his Almeida degree from his online profile. Asha Tomlinson, CBC News, Toronto. That was just one story Marketplace uncovered in its investigation. To see who else is faking it, watch the season premiere of Marketplace this Friday at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland. Now stay tuned for the return of At Issue. We love you. We support you and we love you. A racially charged incident turns an NDP leadership candidate into a YouTube star. Does Jack Meat Singh rival Justin Trudeau when it comes to being cool or sunny? Plus, self-driving cars could be programmed to kill. 
First, a look at today's business numbers. The TSX rose 45 points. The dollar dropped a tenth of a cent. In New York, the Dow gained 45 points as it rides its record high this week. The price of oil fell 59 cents a barrel. I'll tell you a quick story about Obama. Um, it was a big deal for us. It was, a, you know, the first time that, that I'd uh, had an interview with a, a U.S. president while, while in office. In fact, I think it was the first time CBC had ever had a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with a U.S. president. He'd just taken office. He'd only been there a month. Uh, so it, it, it was a big deal. Um, we didn't get a lot of time with him. I think it was 12 minutes or something it ended up being. Uh, and they were in a real rush to, to move him along because he had to fly out to the western United States somewhere, so the helicopter was waiting on the, the pad outside. So um, they, they bring him in, he, you know, he, it was in the map room of the, the White House right on the, the main floor. He walks in, has the arm out, he says, Peter, welcome to the White House, great to have you here. And I'm going, jeez, this is great. You know? <laughs> guy obviously must watch us online every night. You know? <laughs> so he sits down and we, you know, do a little small talk while they're setting up the mics and everything and that was all very nice. Uh, and then we get into the interview and it was bang, bang, bang. It was all the things you'd expect, Afghanistan, the economy, uh, there was stuff about the, uh, the oil sands. There was a, a variety of different questions and he showed a remarkable knowledge of, of Canada and he'd obviously been properly briefed on, on some of these some of these issues. Then suddenly, you know, it was over. And he says, uh, you know, thanks very much. We shake hands. His people are on him like immediately saying, we've got to go, Mr. President. So off he went out the door. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm going, wow, I just you know, interviewed the President of the United States. And after you turn to the crew to make sure they actually were recording when you were doing it, I, I looked at the producer who'd done a lot of the work to, to, to make this happen, her name is Samira Hussein. She works for the BBC now, right, in, in, uh, in New York. And I looked at Samira, who was sitting on the floor, just basically right between the president and I during the, the, the news here, we were just out of, uh, during the interview, but just out of camera range, and I said, so, Samira, how did it go? What do you think? And Samira Hussein was like the gold medal winner at Concordia, or she's like a great young journalist. She looked at me and she went, he's so gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yeah, right, of course, but you know, did we get what we came here for? And she said, I don't know, I didn't hear a word he said. <laughs> so as that's happening, there's suddenly this kind of noise at the, at the door. At the, at the entrance and look up and it's, it's him again. It's the President of the United States. He's coming back in, he's going, Peter! Because, you know, we're... <laughs> he says, I've got somebody you have to meet. And I said, I'm thinking, the President of the United States, that's somebody I have to meet? Yeah. This is like crazy. And he's tall, right? I'm, I'm six foot, he's like six two. And the guy beside him was about six five. Big tall guy. And he looks at him. And this is the answer to Paul's second question. He looks at him and he says, This is Marvin Nicholson. He's from Victoria. <laughs> I'm going, He's gone out, you know, he's heading to the helicopter. He's met some other Canadian. And he's brought him back in the White House. Here we go again. MPs return to the House of Commons on Monday. That's our signal to bring back Canada's most watched political panel. They've got lots to say after a summer that was far from quiet. 
house rose for the summer, Justin Trudeau's approval rates were still riding high, over 60 percent. Conservatives were mending fences and rallying the ranks behind new leader Andrew Scheer after a bruising leadership race. What is your view? And the NDP was deep in the race to replace Tom Mulcair. But just days after the pomp and ceremony of Canada 150, Trudeau dropped a bomb, a $10 million settlement for Omar Khadr. Not only would we have inevitably lost, but uh, estimates range from 30 to 40 million dollars that it would have ended up costing the government. There was some support, but lots of outrage. And it's not just wrong, it's disgusting. Canadians are rightly outraged. We are wrong. And now Finance Minister Bill Morneau is taking aim at three loopholes in the tax code, upsetting small business, doctors and farmers. We think that those rules need to be changed because we're seeing an increasing number of people taking some advantages that weren't intended for that. And then this. My friends, we'll just sort this situation out. We'll be right back. I love you all. These are things that happen. It's okay. It's no big deal. NDP leadership candidate Jagmeet Singh faced with a heckler. He raked in praise for his response. So lots of juicy subjects for our at issue panel. So let's get started. Andrew is in Toronto. Chantal is in Montreal. And Althea joins us from Ottawa. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you. Let the fun begin. Andrew, I'll start with you on this whole tax issue. Uh, closing tax loopholes sounds like a good idea, but all kinds of people are mad at Justin Trudeau or, or Morneau. What's your take? Is this, is this a mistake? Is it a, an error of communication? What's up? I think it was intended to address a legitimate problem, which is people, just by the virtue of incorporating themselves, being able to reduce their tax by thousands of dollars. Whether the particular provisions that the Liberals have, have dra drafted for this are the way to address it is another question. Uh, but it's the details and the, the policy merits, I think, to some extent, have been lost in a more general sense among small businesses and doctors that they've been insulted, that they've been under attack, that they've been called tax cheats, for example, which I don't think the government's actually done, but the message is out there. Uh, and so while I, every time you touch the tax code, you, you're always going to have some controversy around that, which is probably why they released it in the summer, I don't think they anticipated it would be quite as hot as this. And what you've seen as time has gone on is the Conservatives have jumped in, and it's become this contest as to who can best represent average folks, who's on the side of average folks in this issue. The Liberals probably thought, well, they're going to get the, that mantle by virtue of closing a tax break that mostly benefits people on higher income. But it's been transformed, as I say, into an attack on, on small businesses generally. Uh, and it's going to be easy, interesting to see how that plays out. Who's best able to, to wear the, the mantle of defender of the average person? What's your take, Chantal? Well, I think most average persons have not engaged in this debate so far uh, and, and will probably become engaged as it becomes a, an issue in the House of Commons. Uh, but that also means that uh, it is much too early to A, say that uh, the Liberals have miscommunicated and so lost the debate. Uh, before the battle has actually even started, or even to predict that they will lose that debate. Uh, that really remains to be seen. Uh, and then they have left themselves some room uh, to tweak their own proposals. And you know what a headline that says government has uh, modified its stance does to, to a public that is not engaged? It basically says, well, you know, They've done whatever it is that they do, and nobody's going to be happy, but they're fighting for me. So if I were the Conservatives, I'm not so sure I would relish a battle on that particular battleground. So what is going to happen then, Althea? I mean, we've got Liberal MPs offside on this. You don't see that very often. Um, how dire is that, or are changes coming? What's your, your sense? Yeah, I think actually they did miscommunicate this from the beginning. There was there seemed to be no communications plan at all attached to the announcement of the consultations basically landing in the middle of July, early July. Um, and you had a lot of members of parliament basically who got flooded with not just constituency concerns, but from groups like the Canadian Medical Association, from small business groups, lobby groups, um, who made them feel like, oh no, your seat might be in jeopardy. And there was a lot of people who are not in very safe seats. For example, we were in Kelowna for the Liberal caucus last week. That is a conservative seat. And that MP, Steve Fuhr, was out there speaking on behalf of his constituents, saying this law needs to change. And when you have so many MPs out there uh, vocally disagreeing with the government and saying, this week we had another one uh, from Audi, saying, 
I'm prepared to vote basically non-confidence in this government unless there are amendments. You know that there are tweaks coming because the government would not allow uh, that type of language out there um, if they were not prepared to make what Mr. Morneau, the finance minister, now calls administrative changes. But I agree with Andrew. This is a battle that the Conservatives are basically like they are salivating for. They want to paint Justin Trudeau as a celebrity politician who's totally out of touch with Canadians, the average person. And this is something we're going to hear more and more as uh, the days go on in question period with real life people stories like Jane Fox and her family farm and things like that. I think it's that's an important point just to pick up on that is beyond this particular issue, that's a broader narrative that the Tories want to paint of Justin Trudeau. So even if they don't you know, take him down or anything over this issue, if they can add this into the hopper of things they'd like to be able to remind voters of and paint this broader portrait over time of rich elite doesn't doesn't understand average folks that can be damaging over time but for that they will have to demonstrate that this is an attack on average folks That's and right. if they're going to do that i would suggest that having doctors as uh, the face on this is not as good as having nurses so Andrew, and then what, what else is go ahead plan. althea I'm just going to say the nurses actually support the liberals with this plan, and the doctors I'm, I'm have not. Saying. Yeah, and the doctors have not done themselves uh, any favors. You know, standing up in the middle of a town hall saying, yeah, "I probably make three hundred thousand dollars a year, but I can't afford to have children." Well, there's a hell of a lot of people in this country who are having children with a lot less than three hundred thousand dollars a year. So, Andrew, what else do the conservatives have up their sleeves? So we heard uh, there was a lot of reaction on the payout to Omar Khadr. There's pot uh, legislation coming. What what else are the conservatives going to focus on in the next few months? Well, they say also that. The this question of the border crosses if it still remains salient and it, it could return at any time this particular thing of the people flooding into Quebec the Haitian uh, immigrants from from the United States uh, the asylum seekers uh, this seems to have faded but it could come back and they're certainly going to be raising that as to whether Justin Trudeau had encouraged this or had been reckless or, or negligent on this issue as you mentioned they've talked about the Omar Khadr thing again you kind of wonder yeah everybody was pretty hot up about it at the time is that still going to have much salience two three four months uh, later uh, but that's certainly something they've been talking about um, we're still waiting for that sort of positive Im positive alternative that uh, Andrew Shears talked about it so far they seem to be just kind of pressing on pretty familiar hot button issues um, but give him time maybe he's this, this you know maybe this is when he's going to roll it out in the fall a more a more broadly uh, positive conservative alternative but we're waiting to see that so Chantel um, how's he doing the new conservative leader and, and what's the focus going to uh, be I mean looking looking at those summer months uh, and they are only that summer months the impression you get is that uh, the conservatives are still in the echo chamber uh, and, and what they think are big hits or think that resonate within their tent, but their tent is very much shrunk, uh, and, and there is no sense that they are totally aware of this. Now, if I were looking for trouble spots, uh, uh, and for a different reason, I'd be looking at the cannabis file, uh, because it is looking like implementation is going to be quite messy, with uh, the provinces uh, fairly unhappy about how this is proceeding. And if, if you talk to people, I don't know, maybe it's Montreal, but you're more likely to hear about cannabis legislation and, and whatever is coming down that road than you are about doctors uh, getting tax changes that they don't like. So this goes to competence. This is a signature promise of Justin Trudeau. If the implementation of it uh, does not roll out in a way that uh, speaks to competence, it could hurt the government. Yeah, there you've got a number of groups, including the police, uh, coming forward and saying, we're not ready, hang on. Uh, is, is that, is the pot issue one you're going to be watching? Absolutely. It's definitely something on the Liberals' agenda as well. I mean, uh, add that to national security, uh, to the fundraising changes that the government promised um, and introduced early in the spring that have yet to be really debated. But the pot issue is something that is going to come up. And we saw the Conservatives actually today uh, wave sort of the, the first flags, and you really need to push back uh, your timeline on this. This is not doable. The police are telling us it's not doable. The provinces want an extension, this 11th month, and now 10 months, that you've given yourself to uh, make pot legal in this country is not enough time. Uh, the other sort of um, quirk that we're going to see in the fall is that 
uh, the government is going to start introducing time allocation so that they can move these pieces of legislation and send them to the Senate. And now we have an activist Senate that in the past several months has sent legislation back to the House of Commons. So there's this kind of like black box where the government doesn't know how much time it actually needs to pass legislation through. They can't count on the safe passage of their bills. Um, so we're going to, I think, hear a bit more about some procedural, uh, procedural uh, anger issues from the opposition as well, saying this is not the type of parliament that you promised Canadians. Chantal, I'm going to come back to you on the NDP, assuming the big focus there, of course, is the leadership race. Uh, we saw that little clip of Jagmeet Singh being confronted by that heckler. 50 million views uh, online. It's created quite the sensation. So is he going to win? No. Uh, what's going to happen? <laughs> what's the, what's, uh, what should we expect in the leadership race? Well, one, I don't know if Jack meets Jetmeet Singh is going to win, but I do know that this video could help him uh, on the first ballot, or it could translate into more support on the second ballot. It, it probably makes it easier uh, to support him for many NDP members who don't really know yet what to make of him uh, than if it would, if it hadn't happened. That being said, regardless of who's going to be elected leader of the NDP, this is a party that is going to face uh, serious uh, unity issues. Uh, it, the transition is going to be difficult. So, Andrew, Jagmeet Singh seemed for many people, probably many Canadians, hearing about him for the first time this summer. Um, what's going on? Is it just that he's got a nice wardrobe and he's clever? Or what's what's or is it division that uh, Chantal is pointing to? What's, well, he, what's going on? He's very likable. He has a, a presence to him. He's approachable. He's got a lot of those kind of EQ uh, uh, political talents that people are looking for, especially in this day. And he's something of the same uh, appeal as Justin Trudeau in that regard. I think the fact that he's a visible minority is, a, is obviously a breakthrough as well. And that gets people excited, particularly in the NDP, which likes to feel, feel it's on the forefront of these kinds of issues. Um, and as Chantal mentioned, you've also got a party that's very divided over a number of different fronts, particularly on between its traditional base outside Quebec and that base that it established in Quebec and it's trying to, to hold on to. And so the, the issue of Bill 60, 62 in Quebec on the, on the use of the NECOB in public services uh, sort of detonated in the middle of this campaign and caused people a lot of grief. He was able, I think, to sort of sidestep some of the, the flack from that. Uh, and, you know, maybe Faute de Mille has, has emerged stronger as a result. Because I don't know if he was able to sidestep the flack. I think he uh, walked right into the flack. In fact, uh, Pierre Nantel, one of the NDP MPs, suggested that you know some of the candidates, basically everybody other than Guy Caron, uh, won't be able to uh, win New Democrats supporters and basically soft nationalists because they don't want to have the federal government interfere in their sphere of jurisdiction. I think it's actually caused this kind of like mini bomb in the NDP leadership race that Mr. Caron nicely planted there because he wanted to distinguish himself. Mm -hmm. Well, all uh, leadership races, I guess, divide parties to some extent. Uh, Andrew, and then quickly, Chantel, what does it mean, I guess, beyond that party? What does it mean for the other parties, the impact of a new new leader? The NDP has, didn't do as well as hoped in the last election, as well as they uh, hoped in the last election. Well, it changes the game in a, a variety of ways. In Quebec, a weaker NDP is probably good for the Liberals. Might be good for the Bloc Québécois. Remember them. Uh, Frankly, but yeah. it could also be. Uh, I mean, depending on who is leader, the NDP believes, for instance, those who support Jack Meet Singh, that the NDP could be more competitive in the GTA uh, in the suburban, diverse communities uh, in BC. Well, that is something the Liberals would obviously take seriously. So. Yes, uh, depending on who is leader and depending on the strength of the party after the leadership, you could see uh, some movement uh, and some of it to the advantage of the Liberals and others uh, posing new challenges. Two sentences, Andrew, you agree? The Liberals have had a lovely time in the middle with two parties, neither of which had a full-time leader, a permanent leader. Now the game is on. Both of them have leaders and the center ground is going to be really under, under attack from both sides. Wonderful to have you all back. Thanks so much. Thank you. Up next, the potential dangers of self-driving vehicles. Computers react more quickly than humans, but what do we know about their moral judgment? Under the instruction of the Bank of Canada, two Ottawa firms do most of the processing of currency. Two years ago, it was decided to bring out Canadian Elizabethan dollars. The product of the work that began then will be seen this week when the new bills come into use.
come out open here and give to the tellers. The new bills look a little strange at first. A more mature Queen Elizabeth is on the front. Robins claim territory on the back. The bills are more detailed, more colorful. The bold numbers make it easier for visually impaired people to use. But visually, they don't appeal to everyone. I don't like them. Exactly. That's why should we change? Canada's new $1 coins came tumbling off the mint's money presses today, and some people are already calling them loonies. They're made of nickel, copper, and recycled old tin cans. They're gold-colored, and they have 11 sides. Last fall, a courier service lost the original design of a voyageur, so it was switched to a loon swimming on a lake. It's coming, the latest addition to Canada's coin collection. Here's a sample token of the new bimetal coin, nickel on the outside with an aluminum bronze center. Now all they have to figure out is what design to put in the middle. There's no shortage of ideas. At the Canadian Mint, there are 19,000 of them. This design embodies the strength and the determination of Canadians from coast to coast. The new bills are smooth, almost slick, with clear windows. And they won't tear yeah, easily. Told you. There's a great future, the Bank of Canada says, in bills that feel like plastic. These new banknotes are a 21st century achievement in which all Canadians can take pride and in which all Canadians can place their confidence. When the banks open this week, you'll find the latest symbol of Canada's age of development, the new Canadian dollar. I'm Jesse Hirsch, a technology futurist and researcher, and I have a warning for you. Self-driving cars are programmed to kill. Google, GM, Ford, FedEx, Uber, Tesla. These companies are betting their futures on self-driving cars and trucks. Robots on wheels that are poised to transform our cities and make commuting easier. But did you know they also need to be programmed to kill? People die in traffic all the time. We call these accidents because humans make mistakes. But with self-driving cars, we can't call them accidents, as computers operate at a faster speed. Where humans cannot react in time, machines ought to. Self-driving cars will have to be programmed to anticipate scenarios where human life may be at risk. Instant decisions will have to be made that may value some lives over others. Imagine a driverless car driving down a two-lane road, and on the right side is a grandmother walking her dog. In the opposing lane, a large truck approaches, and suddenly a child runs out in front of the self-driving car, leaving no room to stop in time. The car needs to make a choice. Continue straight ahead and kill the child, veer right and kill the grandmother, or veer left and collide with the truck, killing the passengers in the car. The car needs to have all of this programmed in ahead of time. It might even affect which car you choose to buy or hire. Would you buy a car designed to kill you? Or would you prefer one that valued children over the elderly? Or vice versa? I think about this as a pedestrian. 
I never enter an intersection or cross a busy street without first making eye contact with the driver. I want to know that they see me and acknowledge my humanity before I put myself at risk by entering the roadway. How will I make eye contact with a self-driving car? We should be able to cross a street without fear that a robot will run us over. And we need more transparency and understanding about the moral programming that goes into self-driving cars. This is too important a decision to be made by the auto industry alone. Regulators must ensure public participation. Already, the U.S. Congress is passing a law that allows the federal government to exempt self-driving cars from existing safety standards, continuing the tradition of valuing cars over humans. We need to debate these ethical and design issues as these vehicles start driving among us. For The National, I'm Jesse Hirsch. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, 13 years after the expose on the fast food industry with his documentary Super Size Me, Morgan Spurlock ruffles the chicken industry's feathers with Super Size Me 2. On The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. A year ago, this woman heaved a brick through the rose-colored picture window of the American suburban bungalow and invited the resident housewife to take a clear look at the outside world. And you know, in many ways, it's more revolutionary to regard women as simply another human being without any mystique than all of the rights that we won on paper many years ago and which, unfortunately, too few women have really used. You see, the feminine mystique has made us feel it's unfeminine to use our rights. You know, what, kind of, what kind of girl is she? Seems like a real bitch. <laughs> but what I've uh, come to understand lately is it's not always personal. It is, is that all women come in for this kind of stuff? Because I keep meeting women who I've heard all my life are bitchy and pushy and so on and so forth. I meet them and they're, they're nice, compassionate people. It's, if, if you don't play your role, you know, if you dare to aspire to something, then, then you get it automatically. But I don't mind them consorting with truck drivers. The question is what truck drivers like to have neurotic women like you. You think uh, I'm a neurotic woman? Well, there's a lot of truck drivers who be very uptight. Why should you think that? I have controlled myself all the time in this situation. I have not insulted either of you, whatever uh, my but, private opinions right, may be fine. about I'm you. And you have both. He has called my friends, he has called the women I work with by every filthy name he could lay his tongue to without being bleeped out. Yeah, I cannot sorry, have you sitting here that's distorting my book for the people who are foolish enough to think that you know about things. All right, what, what did you I say about the truck driver? said yeah. was, the woman who is going to university who has actually got a chance to read Marx, who has actually got a chance to figure out the way the world is organized, which is difficult enough, had better justify that privilege and the money spent on her by turning those advantages back to the people who haven't got them. I think that feminism has suffered from having the agenda be perceived as overloaded and uh, being hijacked by the left. A feminism that motivates all women of every background across the political spectrum to say, hey, I'm entitled to get in on this conversation is a much more effective guarantee of women's rights than a situation which everyone believes what I believe. Starting October 13th on CBC. Framed for murder. I know Willie Murdoch. Murdoch didn't kill anyone. Locked behind bars. You've hurt her. They should have protected me. Your what? I'll kill you. Everyone close to Murdoch is a target. Who lives? Who dies? Where is she? Don't miss the shocking Murdoch premiere, Monday, September 25th on CBC. You think Canadian history is boring? Well, it's not. Canadian history is filled with blood and guts and explosions and adventures. And that's just Parliament Hill in the 1970s. Rick Mercer hosts Just for Laughs, Brings a Little Hell, Tuesday at 8 on CBC. And before we go tonight, a quick recap of our top stories. 
North Korea has launched another missile over Japan. South Korea says it flew over the northern island of Hokkaido before dropping into the Pacific Ocean. The latest act of aggression comes just days after the UN approved tough sanctions on Pyongyang. And more mixed messages today from the White House. This morning, Donald Trump said he was close to a deal with the Democrats to protect young undocumented immigrants. But later, in this. Ultimately, we have to have the wall. If we don't have the wall, we're doing nothing. The U.S. president appears to say any agreement on immigration comes with conditions. Democrats have vowed to block funding for the border wall with Mexico. And that's The National for this Thursday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Wendy Mesley. Thanks for watching.